Right. So, do you want to get started? Yeah, let me just um, put this on mute. Forgot about that. There we go. All right. Kia ora. Welcome everyone to OANS's Lunch and Learn series. Thanks for joining us to, for today's webinar um, called Adventures in Organic Regenerative Wine Growing. I'm Tiffany Tompkins from Organics Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I'm joined by Nick Gill from Greystone Wines in Wybra, Canterbury. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, firstly, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Today's webinar will take place over an hour. We'll be recording the session, so please keep yourself muted. The webinar will be available on Owens's website in the coming week, and so there'll be and, and there'll be opportunity to ask questions via the chat function today. So please feel free to make comments and ask questions as we go using that chat function. And we've got the amazing Lou Vicente, um, Owens Marcom manager is here with us to make sure your questions get answered. So in doubt, use the chat and please mute. In today's session, we're talking to Nick about how his trials and regenerative wine growing complements and improved upon Greystone's existing organic systems. We're highlighting uh, things that went well and then other things that didn't go so well. And I have to say, I have, a, I have a feeling that having this conversation right now is, is incredibly important. You know, as, as the North Island is reeling from the damage caused by Cyclone Gabriel, I know that climate change is on just about everyone's mind. And I want to make sure we talk about adaptation and resilience. So weather events occurring across the country over the last few years, um, I know particularly here in Marlborough, I have seen the weather patterns change significantly over the last four years. Um, you know, these phenomena has proven that our new normal is nothing like what we had considered normal in the past. So let's talk, let's talk about resilience and adaptation a bit today. Uh, Nick and I will have a conversation and then we'll open it up to Q&A um, from the questions in your chat. And I have to say, I'm really happy to introduce Nick Gill. Nick is the general manager at Greystone Wines, which is a vertically integrated organic wine company that manages 50 hectares and produces roughly 15 to 20,000 dozen cases um, of wine that's sold around the world. He's also an associate board member of Quorum Sense, who has been conducting the region trial at Greystone, which we will talk about in a few minutes. And when Nick's not championing grapes, he is home running the food farm with his family. And the food farm is a 16 acre organic permaculture farm that grows an enormous variety of foods, I have to say. And what's really special about the food farm is that they hold classes to teach others how to grow food. And I'm dying dying to get into one of your classes, Nick. They look absolutely incredible and I've got to make it make it your way sometime soon and, and get in one before the winter season arrives. Yeah. Um, if you like beautiful pictures of food that inspire you, then you really should check out um, the Food Farm New Zealand on Instagram. So it's their handle is the Food Farm NZ and it's absolutely fantastic. And, and Nick, you and your wife, I have to say, are, are, are total legends. Um, I'm a bit of a fangirl. Your, your wife, Angela Clifford, is CEO of Eat New Zealand, which is an organization I really admire. It's doing an incredible job telling Aotearoa's national food story and connecting people to the land and helping people discover that sort of sense of place through food. And so make sure everybody checks out Eat New Zealand as well. And at Greystone Wines, through your incredible leadership, Nick, and in your team, you, you've been on this really interesting journey, starting from conventional through to organic certification, and now you're amplifying what I would call climate-focused practices, including becoming net carbon zero certified. Um, so you guys are like organic superheroes. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to say, let's begin. Um, we're going to have a great conversation. And I want to just start off by asking you about or Greystone's organic journey. 
the company started off as a com, you know in com, in as conventional vineyard um, yes. that later converted to organic. And I was wondering if you could walk us through a little bit about that journey, um, starting with why did you choose organic? Sure. Um, thanks, Tess and Lou, for inviting me. And I just like to quickly acknowledge to everyone in the North Island that's you know going through a really tough period at the moment. Um, our thoughts are with you and. Um, it is really tough when when these things happen. So uh, yeah, just Absolutely. hard. But I'm sure there's some rays of sunshine coming for everybody. Um, yeah, we moved here from 2004 to set up Greystone Vineyard and definitely started on a conventional basis. I grew up on a conventional farm in Australia and went into conventional vineyards. But from the, probably the late 90s. Um, I was kind of running this parallel system where we were growing our own food organically, but in the day job, running it conventionally. Um, and I sort of, as time went on, I became aware I was running two value systems. And um, as I became aware of that, there was the opportunity to talk to other people that are, you know, in the management team at Greystone and also the owner. and develop a production system for Greystone that really reflected all their values. So the winemaker Don Maxwell and I have worked together since 2004. Um, and along with the rest of the people in the team, we, we over a long period of time, to be honest, talked about um, what organics meant to us and how we saw the future. And we identified that really, we all had a strong value set that meant that organics was better aligned for us than conventional farming. So after that discussion, we had to get the, the shareholder on board, which wasn't altogether difficult. Um, and then we basically made a, made a plan and started to implement it. Um, and over a period of time, obviously became certified organic and then identified some more opportunities for, for growth from there. Um, and that's what we're talking about today, I guess, is just sharing that journey and what our experience has been and what's worked and also what hasn't worked. But if you've logged on to hear me tell you what the answer is, you're going to be sore, sorely disappointed because, you know, it's every farm's different and, and I still couldn't tell you what the answer is. But just in the spirit of sharing, that's, that's why I'm here, just to explain what we've discovered, yeah, and what we've found and what we've observed and where we currently are and what we're sort of see as the next steps for us. That's that's great. Thanks, Nick. It's it's really important to to share what's worked and what hasn't worked. I think it's important to share, you know, everything that you've learned so that other people can can glean from from your experience and perhaps take some of the um some of the insights to to work on their their own vineyards or their own farms. Yeah. Uh, looking at your transition to organics, how did you actually get started? What, what was, what you know? A lot of people come to us and say, "How do I start?" What yeah. was your experience? I mean, how do you get started? I I did bring a little bit of. Um, I was when we talked about doing it. I was quite scared about botrytis rather than powdery mildew. Um, having spent most of my great growing career in South Australia. Um, Botrytis was, wasn't something I had a, a lot of knowledge or experience with. I, I was pretty familiar with downy and powdery. Um, so when I moved to New Zealand and started farming grapes, I kind of brought this inherent fear of botrytis a little bit. Um, and and uh, over the seasons, I always remember 2014 season here, um, you know, everybody had botrytis and it didn't matter if I talked to someone that was running an organic system or someone that was running full chemical belts and braces, we all had botrytis. Um, so some of it, I think over that period, I started to realise the value of cultural practices and making sure that if you're going to do this, um, that you, you know, your, your fruit's well spaced out and you've got the air flow and the sunshine and all that sort of stuff. But what we did was we kind of mapped out a bit of a pathway. And before we started, I, I don't tend to do landslide management. I, I do little things. I try to just implement little things and see how it goes one at, one at a time. Sometimes lots of little things at once, which does kind of equal a large thing. But um, so we started doing an organic canopy spray program um, probably two seasons before we converted. 
um, and got comfortable with that and identified, you know, for instance, just how important um, their, their sprayers were going to be and just going and getting the spray papers again and making sure that you have got really good spray coverage and making sure that we've got enough people and enough sprayers to get over the vineyard with really tight spray intervals, which back then was 10 to 14 days. Now it's even tighter because of the way powdery mildew has changed. Um, so we had a bit of a practice, but in my head, I was never terribly worried about weed control because we just basically sold our herbicide unit and got an undivine weeder. And, you know, there's lots of different ones and we got a brawn and it's been fantastic. But over a period of time, using the brawn to replace their weed control and how we were doing it with herbicide led to some other issues, which is one of the reasons why we started to consider regenerative practices as well. Great. So now that you've been certified organic for quite a while, how important is organics to your brand? Oh, it's like a central pillar that we stand on. And I still remember the day when we did it, we went down to the spray shed and cleared out the spray shed and we got all these chemicals out and we put them on a pallet in their workshop and we invited the local wine growing community that was, you know, that would like them to come and get them. And um, and things like full face respirators and all that sort of stuff, we didn't need them anymore. And even members of the vineyard team um, who were kind of just part of the process and they were quite happy to be organic, but didn't really, you know, weren't passionate about it one way or another. That had a real impact on people, I think, understanding that we no longer had, um, you know, some of these chemicals in the shed that required full overalls and, and respirator and re-entry times of a week and, you know, insecticides that are, if you had accidentally got it on you or in you, it was going to be a trip to the doctor and God knows what. So that was a really important part of it for us. Um, I can't actually remember what your question was, Tiff, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's a really powerful image um, of, of giving giving that equipment and, and that those sort of chemical safeguards um, onto others that wanted to continue to utilize them. Um, and, and in doing so and in switching to organics, what were some of the cost impl implications of that? And, and have, has, has there been an, a significant increase of cost? Has it diminished over time? Is it just, you know, how do you function with some of the cost differences? Yeah, I think if I was to do it again, I would look at my operating costs for probably the first couple of seasons. So we put some capital projects in, like we bought a undervine weeder and um, you know, did some work on air sprayers and um, what else did we do? The other, the other thing that caught me out really was the effects on the vineyard infrastructure of doing undervine weeders. We, we ended up, we were doing so much damage to the drip lines, we had to lift all the drip lines. Mm -hmm. um, and that happened over a period of years. Um, and that was an increase in the operating costs. And even things like, you know, you're, we were slicing off um, irrigation rises or there might be a block where all the rises go across the middle of the block and you've put a metal stake but there's this one row that you forgot about it's a short row and the riser comes up out of the ground on an angle and you slice that one off so there's this kind of this transition period of finding all these little things and to me a lot of those things they're not cultural they're just infrastructure and you find all these funny little weak points that you have to address but none of them were terribly complicated it was just like step by step so from that point of view depending on your situation and your resources there's an argument to do some of the vineyard at once and we we didn't do all the vineyard at once we did it over a couple of steps so then those issues with um raising the irrigation lines protecting the risers and that sort of stuff we could sort of have a bit of a practice on the 10 hectares that were closest to the sheds and then work their way out um, I think also recognising that not only all vineyards and regions are different and whether you're talking an organic or a regenerative farming system, it has to be tailored to your place um, and they're not necessarily going to translate to other places. Well, you can take learnings across, but you have to be super focused on yours. Um, and that's the same with the vineyard blocks as well, how we run the vineyard blocks on the creek flats are vastly different to how we run 
blocks of Chardonnay growing on Riparia or on limestone, you know, slopes like this, they're just worlds apart because some of the vines were planted in the late 90s at Muddy Water and they're enormous vines, like they're the dominant life force in that vineyard and good luck to a weed if it can get established next to it. But some of the other vineyards kind of need really careful management with regards to weed pressure. So I think when you embark on organics, you're also embarking on a really deep relationship with the vineyard and things like observation and understanding that the system's constantly changing and having the ability to change your management according to what you can see and what's happening is super important because if you're used to a kind of a, a calendar system or a set and forget system and you go into these more dynamic organic systems, I mean organic in terms of life force, um, you're going to struggle. Mm. Hey, hey, Nick, um, we've got a question from um, Janet in the audience. She's asking, when did you start to look at the soil biology? Yeah, we, we only started looking at the soil biology fairly recently, and I, I would like to look at it a lot more, but, you know, things like budgets always get in the way of your aspirations with these things. Um, and in terms of quantifying our soil biology, that's only started fairly recently, and, and, and we've got a long way to go. Um, with their soil in some regions, reasons, uh, some blocks where, for instance, we've used a lot of um, sprinkless frost control, um, and then we've got springtime fungicide passes and undervine cultivation. Their soil is pretty compacted in some of those blocks. Some of the mm. other blocks where they've been growing under grass at muddy water for a long time, those ones are, are, are pretty good. Um, but in terms of, we were making observations and getting worried about bulk density, um, water infiltration, uh, anaerobic soil conditions, those sort of things, uh, probably probably five to 10 years ago. I've always been a big fan of soil pits. Um, I love having a digger in the vineyard and digging a, digging a deep hole with a slope you can walk down. Um, and fortunately, because we're close to Lincoln, we had quite a few opportunities um, for the soil classes to come out and have a look at their soil pits and they've been able to make observations about, about their soil that have been super useful. But with what we've learned about our soil biology so, biology so far is we, we've we got uh, massive room for improvement, I'd say that way. Yeah, we've, we've hammered our vine row with undervine cultivation for weed control to some extent, and which we've now stopped. Um, so we're hoping to see some improvements. Yeah, and we're also starting to use some Soil treatments, whether it's um, diverse cover crops, um, you know, crimping and rolling, only using a cultivator if we absolutely have to, um, incorporating animals into our into our vineyard as much as we possibly can, more than normal. Like a lot of people have sheep in the vineyard over winter, but you know, we've got a block now we can have sheep in it at any time of year. Um, that's the opportunity, I think. And we've only just started to get some baseline data, which hopefully we can see our soil biology improve. Um, but it's pretty patchy. I'd love to have more data, but you know, when you're running a commercial business, there's always a constraint on resources and finances for those things. They kind of become nice to have a little bit. That's um that that foundation of soil health and soil diversity is is so important, especially um well, for farming across across the country, but in, in wine growing, you know, we think of it as essentially kind of a mono, monoculture crop. And what comes with that monoculture crop seems to be a huge array of problems that don't exist in a natural environment and soil health being one of those. You mentioned a few activities that you're doing to increase, you know, biodiversity. Can you touch a little bit more on perhaps the the organic and regenerative principles that are helping you increase that that soil and the biodiversity as well in your in your um, in your growth. Yeah. Your... So if I if I get distracted and go off the path, just bring me back because I can sometimes do that. But um, yep. one of the things we found, you know, we stopped using a herbicide unit. We started using undervine cultivation. But the Greystone Vineyard is very undulating, and we've got a lot of um, slopes. And when you cultivate your vine row constantly. Uh, well, not constantly, but even just keeping it, you know, kind of as clean as you think it should be. Um, over a period of time, we ended up having quite a lot of soil moving um, down the row and you end up with a wheel rut, which is kind of terrifying when you're trying to pilot a three or four tonne spray rig down a steep hill and your tractor tide decides to go in a rail and you've got no choice to follow the rail. Um, so from that, that's when we started 
thinking about alternatives to cultivation and and how we can manage the vineyard without cultivation. So that sort of uh, a viticulturist Mike Saunders, um, not altogether telling me what he was doing, just stopped weed control in some blocks, and 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 we kind of had to some of the steep blocks we just couldn't keep using under vine cultivation. Um, and then I touched on before we've got uh, blocks on the on the flats which are quite heavy clay loam. They've been under water for frost control since they were planted in 2004 because we have a really poor inversion layer. And if we have one of those springs where we have a lot of um, frost, you know, we, we're applying you know, inches and inches and inches of water. And then it's October and you've got to do a spray round and you're driving through it and you're compacting this soil. And, you know, we were, we were getting vines starting to die in places. Um, and I think that's from anaerobic soil conditions and, and not enough oxygen exchange in the subsoil. So, they were some of the things that we were observing. So we, we, we decided to minimize air cultivation. So we very rarely use undervine um, cultivation for weed control now. We try to use mowing and sheep, although we will still use undervine cultivation if we think it's necessary. Um, we're trying to, and mid row was kind of neglected. It just had in there whatever was in there. There was a couple of high bigger blocks I planted chicory in years ago to try to draw it, drag some moisture out of them, but a lot of them were just like endemic grasses and stuff like that. And of course, as you manage them, you're selecting for plants that can survive under constant mowing and hard grazing in winter. And a lot of those plants aren't terribly useful. So we have started to establish diverse cover crops and everyone's seen pictures of sunflowers and regenerative organics and uh, regenerative agriculture and that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, that's been a bit of a journey in itself because at Quorum Sense, um, talking to people who are getting these amazing crops established with um, great min mintel cedars and that sort of stuff, often are still using some herbicide to knock down and, and, it, and that's not an option that's available to us. That's, that's just what it is. Um, and my understanding was both um, at Greystone and at Food Farm, if we did it well, we'd be able to get stuff established by sort of trampling it in. So I tried that and, you know, maybe their soil's not well suited to it, or maybe we've got a little bit too, more, too much thatch, but I tried it both. We've tried it both at the food farm in at Greystone where we graze down to the boards, like, you know, super hard, um, quite wet soil, a lot of moisture coming. And then I, I spread like double the normal sowing rate, 50 kilograms a hectare of small seeds and then put a combined mob at, at food farm of um, sheep and cattle back on it. So it got pretty trampled in, but, you know, the establishment was pretty patchy. Um, it didn't do that well. What I have noticed at home, though, is it has changed the pasture composition because over the next couple of years, although, for instance, you don't get all these sunflowers coming up, you get a few, but over the next couple of years, you notice clovers and pasture grasses and and, and forbs starting to come up that definitely weren't in my pasture to start with. So I think that's where nature's gone. Actually, you know what, it's not right for me to germinate at the moment. I'm going to germinate in two, year, two years' time in the autumn or something. So some of those slow and steady solutions are still solutions. They're just not instantaneous. Um, but we've found to get cover crops established at Greystone, we do have to use cultivation. We've tried um, doing it without, and the establishment is rubbish. Um, so what we've done is we've um, used a cultivator to uh, rip up the thatch because we do have quite a lot of thatch. Um, and we'll put in an establishment cover crop, which is mainly annuals, with the idea that that's going to get some biology started in the soil. And then our plan is for the future to try to use diverse cover crops that are mostly um, perennial or will set seed and regenerate themselves so that we don't have to do that establishment. Um, bays and bowls being cultivation very often. Well, wow, incredible. You're, you're doing a lot. <laughs> um, you know, well, you're doing a lot of stuff, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, and I was thinking about the, you know, you're going through this, what you think you're calling a region trial with Quorum Sense. Is this, is the trial collecting all the data from all of these different practices that you're incorporating on the vineyard? Tell we're, us a little bit more specifically about, you know, what, what this trial is, is trying to achieve. We're doing really, we're doing farmer uh, data collection, really. It's, it's super basic. We, we don't have um, 
any resources or funding at the moment to do anything more than that. And I, I have opportunities to talk to people about it and then, and then run out of time. So if somebody on here would like to talk to me about that, I'd, I'd love to hear from them. But the trial that we're doing is we all see pictures of sheep in the vineyard in winter time. And that's fantastic. Like I love sheep in the vineyard in winter time. And when we started doing that, I think just that had a positive effect on their soil nutrient cycling and, um, and their ability to uh, get water down into the soil profile and stuff. But you also have to do it well. Like if you're say, stocking with enormous mobs of sheep into a vineyard and kind of forgetting them in July and grazing it back to the mud and they're walking around in mud, like that's not doing any, any good. So, you know, you, ha you still have to be aware of it. But we've got one and a half hectares at the back of the vineyard that the vineyard team, uh, Mike and Liam and the crew have basically um, put the wires up to the top of the post so it's 1.8 metres, six foot, um, and then taken one cord on of the vine up and on. So that's pin and one Riesling. And we've done that with the idea that then we can graze the block at any time of year and the sheep can't eat fruit. Um, so we talked for a long time about how we could have sheep in the vineyard at any time of year. We were calling it 365 days you know, grazing. And I kind of, we decided not to keep using that term because it implies that sheep are in the vineyard all the time. And that's definitely not the case, like ideally, if the sheep come into the vineyard or the, the farm block or whatever into you know a high sward, they graze it down and leave at least a third of it and they, they're quite densely mobbed together. Um, you know, they, they wee and pull over it, they trample it in and then they're out again quite quickly. That's that's the grazing pattern that we're looking for, which kind of emulates wild herd grazing. Um, so we've lifted this block up and it looks quite crazy because the cordon is now at my head height. I'm about six foot high. Um, of course, the sheep can't eat the fruit, but we've run out of we've run out of posts for canopy management. Like we've got none. We don't have any canopy management. It's just like sprawl, which doesn't really freak me out because there's lots of uh, vineyard in the world that is sprawl. But obviously, when you're trying to maximise your sunlight uh, interception and manage disease in a cool climate, sprawl wouldn't normally be the system you'd go for. So it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Um, this is just sort of something that we've started with. And then we've got um, Lizzie from uh, Pisinus Ranch in California. She's with us at the moment and they're operating a, what I, in Australia would call be we call it a YT. I can't remember the name of it here or for them, but it's basically taking the canopy out and over and leaves the fruit zone. But, you know, if you're a person inclined to look for problems, I could make a really, really long list of potential problems with this trellis system, but we're looking at it from the point of view of trying to find solutions and we'll deal with the problems as they come along. Because, you know, imagine if we could get all the vineyard in New Zealand um, so that we could manage the, the, the vine row, the inter row in the water shoots with sheep or some other grazing animal, like this block has had 15 tractor passes instead of the 30 that all the other blocks have had. And being carbon zero for our organization, any diesel reduction we can get is super important, as well as obviously um, reducing costs. Like that's amazing to reduce costs. And the vines look pretty happy. They've got lots of fruit on them. Um, and thankfully, Dom and I, after working together for nearly, nearly 20 years, we've both come up with crazy ideas over the over the years, he decided he wanted to ferment wine in the vineyard in 2012, and we ended up with fermenters all dotted through the vineyard, and we still do. Um, and, and we've decided we want to have sheep in the vineyard in the middle of vintage, um, and we've got these really high vines with no canopy management. Um, and he's like, that's cool. Let's see what they do. Wow. That's that's amazing. I'm sure a lot of people are, are, uh, are going to be, you know, looking uh, eagerly to await how you know your vintage goes this year and um in keeping us all you know up to date in you know what's working what's not um what are your plans and and helping you know sort of give this information back to to the sector um well yeah i, I get like we're just really open if people come to us and say what are you doing where to show them i don't have a i have to admit i don't have a um a very coherent research or communication plan at the moment we're we're doing it because we feel it aligns with their values and, and how we're trying to, you know, go forwards, I guess. 
as, as grape growers and winemakers. Um, uh, and I think one of the things that excites me is even in what we've learned over the last two years of, you know, we'll plant some more vineyard at Greystone at some point. We've still got some, some available land. And, uh, you know, I'd go subsurface irrigation, which we've already got in some blocks, which is fantastic because back in the day, the first subsurface irrigation had trifluralin in, in the uh, drippers so that we didn't get root incursion. And nowadays, uh, you can just, I think it's got a tiny piece of copper in there, so we can use that, so that's pretty good. Um, you don't have any issues with animals going back and forth across the row. I'd go to really high trellis, and I said to you before, Tiff, if I was doing this again, I don't know, some of these low, bigger rootstocks, I don't know if I'd use them. I'd probably go with medium to high, bigger rootstocks so that I have to give them less attention in terms of their growth and just, just get, get myself a big engine. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that kind of brings me up to one of the last major areas that I want to discuss with you today is talking about resilience and adaptation um, to the effects of climate change. So rising temperatures and extreme weather, it, it, it's impacting productivity across the country. and and I know we're all responsible for reducing our impact on the climate, but the management of our agricultural systems is vital to getting through the impacts that, that we're enduring. You know, I know here in Marlboro, the, the fungal pressure this year is the season has just been incredible. And, and, and those trends are, are, are repeating and repeating and repeating. So how do we, you know, organic or not, we, we need a climate strategy, we need climate plans. And so how is Greystone planning um, for the effects of climate change? I know you said if you could do it again, you'd do it in this particular way. But with your, with your current um, vineyards under, under your management, what, what effects are you seeing because of climate change? And what exactly, like exactly how are you able to, to adapt to those changes? Um. <clears throat> Probably a couple of conversations, well, I suppose there's lots of conversations there, but in terms of adapting to climate change, um, Andrew and I are really into permaculture. We did a permaculture design course in the in the early 2000s and um, I was involved with Penfolds then in the Barossa and we were bringing water from the Murray River, which was well oversubscribed and, and putting in more pipes and bringing, bringing it into the Barossa Valley, you know, a really dry area to, to grow grapes. And, and um, and then we were doing this permaculture design course and we and we they were talking about soil and you know natural growing environments. They basically put up a picture of New Zealand soil and climate and rainfall compared to Australia. And that was one of the main reasons that we chose to move to New Zealand, really, is like you know, you can see climate change coming a long time ago, unfortunately. Um, and I think. On a day-to-day -day basis, the way I deal with it in my head is you kind of have to put aside what you've done previously. And if I was on the farm, I grew up on what my father did and what my grandfather did, because those things you have to understand aren't going to work anymore. And to some extent, you know, cause the issues we've got, but not judging people for that. They just, everybody does the best they can at the time, right? Like people might look back at us in a hundred years and go, what the hell were they thinking? Um, but we're not going to stop me doing the best I can today. Um, so the one thing is to be um, really open-minded and those permaculture principles of making observations and being dynamic and being ready to change. Um, it's also understanding that these systems, like what we're talking about with Greystone, they're incredibly complex and you won't have a hope of being able to implement them or develop them unless they align really closely with your heart because they require a real, um, you know, they have to align with your values because there's something you have to live and breathe and do every day. You can't sort of just clock in and clock out with it. Um, so it has to be something you believe in and in something that you're going to work on and understand you're never going to be able to tick the box that says I've done that because it's just a constant state of improvement. Um, so we, we understand that in our farming system, you know, previously, theoretically, we shouldn't have got anything other than a radiation frost, you know, we shouldn't get the, the ones that come down out of the atmosphere, and we, we've had like at least a couple of them now, um, you know, we shouldn't get a minus four degree frost in, in November, but we did, or late October, um, stuff like that, so we just have to think about how can we 
have a system that can potentially cope with these things. And for me, having a vineyard that can cope with a really severe out-of-season frost, there's only so much we can do to protect that. So for us, for Greystone, we're very fortunate that we also have some farmland as part of their property as well. So we're getting ready to develop um, Greystone Farm that Greystone Vineyard is part of because in, for instance, La Nina years when it's kind of wet and there's lots of grass, you know, farmers generally have a good year and vineyards often we do it a bit tough generally. But then in El Nino when it's droughty, our vineyards are pretty happy generally and, and the farmers are doing it a bit tough. So I'll have all that diversity, thanks very much, and shove it in the same business. But it, it is complex and, you know, you have to have people that are on board with it and along with you for it, including the owner. Um, so that's that's kind of the day-to-day -day stuff. And then from a bigger picture point of view, I love to think about that, you know, since we've been farming, whether it's in New Zealand or Australia or wherever, you know, how much topsoil we've lost into the ocean um, and also how much carbon we've lost from the soil into the atmosphere. So from my point of view, if I can look at air, soil carbon in the vineyard and it's currently you know pick a number three percent or whatever it is and and then in a few years time say 10 years time i don't know how long um perhaps we've got it to four percent and i know there's people out there that will be able to tell me if i've gained a percent in this soil type over a hectare there's this many tons of carbon but for me it's just a really simple and effective way of thinking that the more carbon we can help get back into the soil we've pulled out of the atmosphere and you know Angela and I have got three children, um, 19, 16, and 14, and they're terrified of climate change. Like they, they think, you know, for them, climate change is going to kill them. And, um, and when I was growing up, it was a nuclear holocaust. Um, so anything we can do to sort of have that big picture view and everything we're doing is getting that carbon into the soil and out of the atmosphere where it shouldn't be. It's got to be a good thing. And I don't, you know, there's lots of ways to do it, whether you're doing it with your regenerative farming practices or you're, um, you, you, we've got seaweed farms in the ocean or whatever, you know, bring it on. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, we're all in this together. And I was wondering, you know, it, it, based on that philosophy, is that what drove you to the um, net carbon zero certification? Can you tell us what that is and um, what did you have to do to get it? Yeah, no, that, that was pretty interesting. So we, you know, um, we'd been certified organic and became aware of regenerative and started working on that. And, and through regenerative, start thinking about carbon. And I, I sort of, you know, knew what soil carbon was but hadn't thought about the whole carbon cycle too much and it's easy to be over overwhelmed by it and go you know I'm not going to make a difference but of course one I'm not very comfortable with that position because you know you, you, you got to try um and and also um I think for us uh being carbon zero for our organization put kind of a framework behind what we were trying to achieve and it's actually been really interesting because it, it has helped us to identify some really clear things that we could do to reduce our carbon footprint and it's also helped us to think about opportunities on the property that we had that we weren't realizing um, for instance we australia in 2004 above greystone vineyard there's a big hill face um, and my, like most of the hill faces in North Canterbury, it's bare. And if it's not bare, it'll have pine trees on it. And if it's got pine trees on it on the North Face, they probably only did it because it was full of Narcella Tussic, not because they wanted the pine trees. Um, and this space started to, to slip and move. And, you know, I caught tunnel erosion, the locals here caught tomos, and they were, they were blowing out in the vineyard and it was just this enormous mess. And I didn't know what to do. So I put a digger on the hill and caved them all in and bonked it all down. And then it all just blew out again, like it was just an epic fail. Um, so I talked to some locals and they said, oh, the hill country guys use poplar poles. So we, I didn't even know what a poplar pole was. So we got a, like 800 poplar poles and put them across the hill face. And I think about three or 400 survived. Um, and through Toy 2, we realized that those poplars satisfied the requirement for a carbon sink. So you know, a forestry consultant came out and mapped it with a drone and said, well, you know, just by luck, 
you you kind of basically got the beginnings of a of a carbon sink. You've got a couple of gaps here, and I'll show you where to plant the poles, and 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 then we had our own carbon sink. So we've got multiple opportunities to do stuff like that in the vineyard uh, around the vineyard. Um, but also uh, silver pasture, like if we're going to have sheep on the property, well, why not have sheep under trees, for instance, as well? So, yeah. uh, again, I have forgotten what your question was, Tiff. No, that was great. Just telling me, you know, a little bit of what you did to get the Carbon Zero certification. Oh, and, yeah. And, you know, um, so, yeah, it was a really interesting process. When we started a few years ago, I talked to some of their business advisors or like mentors and so forth. and it was pretty, there's lots of people that will talk to you about it. And um, I got nowhere with people that were in, like, they said, yeah, I, I can help you with that. And they'd never ring me back and they'd never email me back. And, a, and this isn't a plug for Toy 2, but when, you know, when we went to Toy 2, they, they gave me a framework and they said, we're going to start here and this is your person that's going to help you get through it. Mm -hmm. um, and you followed the bouncy ball through the steps. And that's, that's and that worked for us. Like, I know some organisations have been able to develop their own accreditation process. We wouldn't have gotten near it if we tried to do it ourselves. It's, it's, it's quite a big framework. And once you start talking ISO requirements and that sort of stuff, we needed a ready-made off-the-shelf system and that's what we can go to us. Um, and then uh, it's like accounting for carbon. And I don't have an accounting brain, so got a fantastic commercial manager, Jenny, who does all her accounts. And it made sense to her. She was just like, well, instead of money, it's, it's carbon, you know. It frustrated her a little bit because um, you don't account it down to the last cent like you do with accounting. You know, there's kind of the minimalist rule or the 80-20 rule where if something's quite a small percentage of your total uh, carbon consumption, you, you don't put so much effort into it. But so we, we got a great... Um, Consign through them, and, and by them, there's probably other people that can do it as well. Um, and we've been able to identify things like using uh, carbon zero sources, sources of electricity. I had no idea before we did it just how much worse for the environment diesel is than petrol, for instance. So, you know, most of their vineyard vehicles are diesel because they have a lot of torque and you know, you can pull things at low speed better and drive through the rivers if you want to and that sort of stuff. But, man, diesel's like a lot worse than petrol, so we'll convert any of those ones to petrol, any cars that we've got on the hybrids. Um, and then there's other things like uh, they look at how much rubbish and recycling you produce and thinking about things like uh, pallet wrap, for instance, we... We do what we can to minimise our use of it. And when we do have it, we put it into the placeback system. Um, we've converted from using plastic tape on our wine boxes to, to paper tape. Um, mm. Just all these little things. Um, so it could be, a, you know, what fuel are we using in the vineyard and how much fuel are we using to, what trees have we got in the hillside to offset our carbon emissions to, um, with their glass bottles that we have to recycle we're looking at instead of recycling them and I, I sometimes worry if they're being recycled like we think they are or could we could we crush them and use them to repair potholes in the roads on the vineyard or something like that you know yeah that's fantastic I mean so how does all of this translate to your consumer to your customer you're organic certified you incorporating re more regenerative practices you know, you're, you're, you're constantly evolving, you're looking at um, your climate resiliency and adaptation and you're, you know, net zero carbon <laughs> certified. So what, what, what is your customer feedback that you're getting from your customers? And, and what are the, in the markets that you're selling your product? What are your consumers looking for? Are you ahead of the curve in understanding how this all comes together? And is this consumer really looking in a dial, dialing into a product like yours and other products that can mimic what you're doing? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. So we've got some people just really love a great glass of Pinot and those people are still super important customers to us. And then we've got people that have almost come to find Greystone through um, what we're doing in terms of farming practices and so forth, and they happen to like a glass of wine. So it's a really big variation, but, um, you know, we're doing these things because they align with their values. Um, 
they definitely will help us sell a glass of wine at the price point we need to sell it for. But to do that, we need effective storytelling. Um, and that's another skill set in itself. And like I said to yourself and Lou, before this started, I, I don't regard myself as a storyteller and have to be dragged in front of the camera. So I surround myself with other storytellers like Angela or, or Stephen and Mike at, at Greystone. So um, we find that generally the audience is really receptive um, and really interested. Um, the Scandinavian countries like Sweden and Denmark are, are very interested in what we're doing and they, they like to know more detail. And we've even got wine retailers in Sydney who were in like a regenerative section and they wanna know, you know, what are your regenerative practices? We're not certified regenerative in any way. So we um, just try to explain what we're doing. So I think, um, uh, if I, sh I shouldn't really do a stereotype, but definitely our, our older generation Greystone lovers came to us because they loved the wine and the, the ones that are coming now are into the wine, but also the fact that, you know, we, we're doing what we can to farm in a way that's, I don't know, not harming the environment, hopefully helping the environment maybe. Yeah, I won't make any big calls on that. Well, thank you so much for your conversation. I just want to open it up to some questions. Lou, do we have any questions to anybody's asked? Or does anybody have There's any no questions? questions? Like that. I'd like to ask Nick if he has any advice for anyone who's considering going on this organic regenerative and carbon zero journey like how what's the best way for someone to get started a conventional grower to get started um yeah so we obviously like we did we did organic first and then kind of regenerative and carbon all together and those things none of these things ever stop too that's the thing is that like, you can't tick the box and say i'm done now um if you're conventional i don't i think it's up to you like some people have an amazing skill set in, in understanding um, their canopy management and disease management in the fruit. And some people have an amazing skill set in um, managing their undervine sward and their mid row and stuff. So look at what your look at what your assets are, you know, like if you've if you've got someone in the team who's really good at managing one of those things, go with that. I I, I wouldn't say you necessarily have to go organic and then regenerative. You can you can do a bit more. I'm I am a big fan of doing some like what I call farmer trials. So they're not like replicated and random and stuff like that. It's just like, you know what, that block there, it's it's close to the sheds, I can watch it. Um, no one can see it from the road or someone can see it from the road, depending on what your attitude is. Um, I'm gonna try it there and I'm gonna watch carefully what happens and learn from it. So my, my advice would be start today, plan to start today, but you don't necessarily have to bet the whole farm on it. Do, do some of it. Um, and, for me, I was a little bit paralyzed to start with. Um, and once I got started, you know, that paralysis by analysis stopped because you can always find a reason not to get started. Like, oh, I, I'm going to wait till I've got a crimp roller because, you know, I haven't got one or um, I can't be organic because I, uh, you know, I, I haven't worked out exactly how I'm going to manage my undivine weeds. But if you, if you do a portion of your vineyard, you've made a start broken that paralysis and you'll start making really important observations and identifying what in your assets, whether it's people, machinery, uh, culture and skill set and experience works. And you can start identifying where your shortfalls are and you can start backfilling, you know. So my advice would be start today and you don't have to bet the farm on it. Start on something you feel you can achieve, whether that's a hectare or, or a couple of rows or something and go from there. Great advice. I loved what you touched on earlier, talking about incorporating permaculture principles as well, and just the ideas of observation and just being ready to change. Um, I think that's really powerful. And um, we've got yeah. a question here from Chris Morrison. Um, what are your export customers looking for? Organic, carbon zero, GMO free, or all? Or is it quality? Um, yeah, so at the moment, organic, because we've been organic the longest, I, I guess that's the one that people ask for the most, but we definitely, so it's we're carbon zero for our organization. We haven't made any of their products carbon zero yet. That's another tier of 
of accreditation uh, and, and does come with quite a lot more processes and costs. So, um, GMO, no one's no one's asked me about GMO free. It would be for us. It would be organic. Um, people want to know what we're doing that's regenerative, but they don't they don't want a certificate. They want us to tell them what our practices are um, and explain to them what we're working on. Um, Carbon zero in New Zealand, not, no one really seems to pay a lot of attention to it yet. Um, our export customers are happy to hear about it, but I wouldn't say it's pushing big sales over the line or anything like that. But you know, a lot of these things we've done it because like I've said, it aligns with their own personal values and we feel it's the future. And also my experience of these things is still even if you've got the best storyteller, it takes time. You have to keep telling the same story over and over and over and over really, really well. And then people will look around and go, oh, Greystone, they came from like an overnight sensation. How did that happen? Be like you've done it, you've been working on it really hard for 20 years. Um, so yeah, that's been my experience of it. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, quality, quality if you don't have the quality, none of these things matter as much you, to, you, know, you want people to try your wine and go oh my god that's delicious obviously yeah and then look at all these other amazing things that they do and Absolutely. what you said earlier with regards to your children and, and climate change was really powerful as well and i wanted to just ask you on a personal level like how do you talk to them about um climate anxiety and how to overcome those kind of i think a lot of people are feeling yeah. that right now and dealing with what's happening I know it's really challenging. Eh? Like our oldest daughter's um, st studying science at UC, and she's been involved with the youth Ropu with ECAN, and they go to she goes to a, a seminar or something. And um, I was worried that she'd come back from them and be distraught or um, feel like it was hopeless. But I think she is a the children are mostly able to see the future, understand it comes with challenges, but also see that solutions are possible and that's probably raising resilient children by not shielding them from um you know challenges and seeing that sometimes you know things happen and it's not ideal but you have to keep moving forwards and have a plan and i don't know i don't know how you raise resilient children really um it's more i think a lot of these things are mindset aren't they yeah yeah, talking about things while like we talk about it, I guess like we don't ignore it's there, it is a real thing. Also not ignoring their fears, like acknowledging it and going, yeah. And, we, and Angel and I talk about it too, like, you know, we thought Ronald Reagan was gonna push the big red button and blow us all up when we were teenagers. Um, and, and that didn't happen, thankfully. Um, but yeah, it doesn't mean it's not going to be tough, but, and also modeling your own personal resilience too. That's what the food farm is. You know, if, um, if the food systems break or something, and I'm not a, not a doom day by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, you can grow, if you, if you, you can grow some food, you know, not everybody can grow some food and obviously massive amounts of the population live in cities above the ground and stuff, and you can't have a garden, but perhaps you can access an allotment, anything where you can, claim some of your food sovereignty or some control over your destiny, you know, grab it and do it. Absolutely. I think what you touched on there is um, one of the best ways to deal with climate anxiety is just um, live uh, the best life you can in terms of the environment, right? And put all these things into practice and they're, they're seeing that on a day-to-day -day basis. So they just know that as being normal. Right? Yeah, exactly. And um, I did a thing called rural sociology when I, I went to Roseworthy, which is kind of like the Australian version of Lincoln, I guess. And we did this thing called rural soci sociology. And you spend weeks sitting in this bloody lectures. And really the take home message was back then, you know, for farming practices to change, you wait, waited for the old fella to die. That's basically, that was the take home message I got from it. Um, and, you know, things do change. And, and if you look at the generations coming through now that are really active, with um, embracing the challenges around climate change. And, you know, I've been told off so many times for not trying hard enough to, to, you know, Glad Rat was a great example in our house. I'd never thought about it. You know, this plastic cling film that we're all addicted yeah. to where, you know, and, 
and my daughters are like, you can't have that anymore, Dad. You know, we're banning it. And it's like, I, so, oh, my God, you know, it's so easy to use and I've always used it. But now, you know, of course, I just wrap my sandwiches in a tea towel and nothing happens and I don't yeah. use the goddamn bread wrap anymore. Like, it's just, just um, embrace the change, I suppose. And I've got a lot of heart with seeing young people come along and things like that. You know, they'll change things quickly. I know we've got massive challenges, but the ability to change things quickly is there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a question from Trevor. He came in late, but he asked if there was any discussion on biochar in the system for carbon. Um, no, we didn't talk about biochar. That's one of the things that I, I haven't got into, not because I don't think it's worthy of merit. I, I just don't know anything about it. I, I love fire. So if I was able to have a fire and help the environment, that sounds awesome, even if I have to put a lid on it and take all its oxygen away. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not the person to talk about biochar, sorry. That's, Trevor, a, that's a great idea for a future um, discussion. We should add it to our webinar list. That's great. Trevor, we will be in touch. Um, I want to just close out here and say thank you to everybody. And thank you to Nick so much for coming and joining us today and, and teaching us all about what Greystone is up to. You've inspired us. And um, I hope that you will check out um, Greystone's website and learn about the trial that's going on. Um, through Quorum Sense. And again, we're, you know, if you have any other questions or want to send us any information, you can send it to myself at tiffany at oans.org and we can send it on to um, Nick and his team. And um, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate everybody that came today. And uh, we're very much looking forward to the next webinar series, which will. Um, be in uh, in a couple of weeks, actually, about ne next month. We'll send out some more information about it. Once that's we Thursday get it. of the month. Yeah. That's Thursday of the month. Yep, that's right. Third Thursday of the month. Cool. All right. Well, everyone, have a fantastic day. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you next time. Awesome. Thank you. Thank have you. Good day, thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Nick.